So these are concepts. Remember, when I give you questions, there's concepts within this. And those concepts are going to show you things that you need to know. You know, as I've told you, you're going to see ABGs on there. I saw four questions last semester. Another thing you're going to see is your growth development Erickson, your Freud, your Kohlberg, Piaget. Make sure you review those. There's four questions there. And math, of course, is always about the same. So if you've done well in the math, you're good so far. You'll be good for the um, for for if there's anything in the HESI. The HESI is usually very very easy. At least what I've seen in the past. Professor yes. Roker, in the cahoots are amazing, but I didn't know if there's any way you have like a Word document that we can print we, out and study that okay. way. I have one of my other professors um, fixing or redoing, making better. A PowerPoint, it should be done by tomorrow and you'll all get that PowerPoint too. So you will have a written PowerPoint with information you can go over also, okay? Thank you. So you have everything you need. All right, let's go ahead, let's get started. I still don't believe it's HESI time already. What is probably the single most important influence on growth at all stages of development? And if you don't know this one, I've said it a hundred times. And I usually say the word over and over and over and over and over again. Because without this, you don't grow. Your cognition is gone. Nutrition, 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 nutrition. Very good. I think I've beat that into y'all's head. <laughs> Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? So we know that children do certain things at certain times. And if they're not progressing forward and they've stopped, something's not right. So we know when they sit up, when they turn over, we know their weight. All of these things are important to look at when we're assessing a child growing. The head to tail direction of growth is referred to as what? Head to tail. It's called cephalocaudal. Cephalo, right? Cephalic, right? Makes sense now, head to toe. I mean, on the exam before, we took the sequential trends. Yes, but this is growth. How do we describe it? Head to toe. What is the single most important factor to consider when communicating with children? So we need to know where their developmental level is so we can describe things we need to do. You know, children, they just want to be told what's going to happen. They don't want surprises. So get on their level and let them know. What two-year-old child pain assessment tool should the nurse use? What pain assessment tool is for a two-year-old? I put this one in here because most of the time you're wrong. 50% of the students. And again, you're wrong, it is flack. Faces are preschoolers, three to four year olds and um, up. We know numerics about eight years old. Flack is nonverbal. So it talks about the way that their face and the grimacing and their legs and their activity and consolability. Those things really will tell you, you know, about their pain. So three-year-old faces, two-year-old flack. That's why I put it here because I know what the outcome would have been. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? So you got a kid dehydrated, which we know dehydration, you know, is really dangerous in children. 
and they're vomiting. So how are we gonna treat it? So we don't want anything in their mouth because they'll continue to vomit. We want IV fluids, then give them the anti-emetic, you know, Donstron, the Zofran, and then slowly introduce liquids back. But IV fluids, get that volume back now. The first expected fine motor developmental milestones for an infant begins with what? Remember F, fingers, fine. G, gross motor, get up and go, go, go. So we know the first one is you put something in their hand and the reflex is for them to grab on it. Many parents will go, oh my goodness, he just hugged my finger for me, isn't that sweet? Well, I'm not gonna tell them it's a reflex because they think they're being hugged. But the first thing is reflex, reflex and then it goes to voluntary. An eight month old infant should be expected to perform which fine motor skills. So we start with a reflex and then we go to voluntary, then what goes on? So then it's the crude pincer. You know, we take the little Cheerios or those little puff snacks they have today and they'll take and just smoosh a handful to start with and then they'll get to be the fine but at eight months old it should be crude so they're they're getting it sort of but not this, just the two little fingers as we get older it's the blocks of two and putting in container at 11 and 12 months old in general an infant should triple their birth weight at what month of age Is it 12 months? At six months, they double. At one year, they triple. Good. Orin is assessing a two and a half year old toddler should report which finding to the provider, which means something's not right. So it's that head circumference. We know newborns are born with big heads, bigger than the chest. As they get to be about two, they should equal. And then a little bit older, the head should be smaller than the chest. And if it's not, and if it's bigger, what's going on? Is there hydrocephalus? Is there a tumor? Something's not right. We need to investigate that. A two-month-old infant has cradle cap. What should the nurse tell the parents to do to treat it? So we're gonna wash it with soap and we can softly, softly, gently brush the hair with a brush or a fine cone, uh, a comb, but we're not gonna do anything vigorously to hurt them. You can wash the hair. Sometimes they say put mineral oil on, but um, we can very uh, softly, gently, we can comb that hair and get some of that cradle cap out of there. According to Kohlberg's pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral development, mo moral reasoning, that understands what? What is Kohlberg all about? <clears throat> so we know Kohlberg is all about children knowing, especially preschoolers ages three to four, they know right and they know wrong but they know that there's a consequences for the right, which means it's a good one and wrong. They know there's something, a punishment, that consequence for the bad. So good and bad is what they understand. 
which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? So use a doll, absolutely. Let them touch the equipment, let them play with the equipment, have them take a blood pressure on you, whatever needs to be done. Make a child not have that stress, make that equipment familiar to them. Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what to encourage cooperation? You know, a toddler ages one to three, they really don't like to be touched by any other people, but let them play, let them touch the stuff. And now they're going to look at your ears and you'll look at their ears, listen to your chest, you know, and their chest. And it gets the assessment done a lot easier. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child would be expected to do what? So a four-year-old, they should be able to follow simple commands. Put your shoes by the door, put your dirty clothes in the laundry, put your glass in the sink. They should be able to do that. That's a simple command. Parents are concerned her eight-month-old child is not developing like their older child. What is normal for eight months? And remember, what's normal in the book may not be normal for your children. Forget you have children when you're thinking about pediatrics. I think that's the hardest thing. So by eight months old, they should sit alone unsupported. Now they can pull themselves into that sitting position, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be able to maintain it. So the answer is to sit alone unsupported. A multi-select, which would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she is caring for. You know, infants can't tell you things like, I see yellow spots and ores around things, or you know, things like I feel nauseous. That's something an infant can't tell you, but they can show other stuff. Normal heart rate for an infant. 140 to 160 on a newborn. So the heart rate is too low. Digit level is way too high. Potassium level is perfect. So we like that. So that's not a problem. We would still give digoxin with that normal level. Um, but vomiting, even if a child has nothing else but just vomiting and they're on digoxin, I'm going to hold it, call the doctor, and I'm going to get a digoxin level. Better to be safe than have a kid with dig toxicity. A four-year-old is reluctant to take medicine. What intervention should the nurse take? And this is a common thing. Four-year-olds, many of them, they just don't want it. And they know every excuse in the world not to take it. So if you walk in and say, this is your medicine, would you like the liquid or would you like to chew a pill? Maybe you have those choices for a four-year-old. And if it's just liquid, do you want it in a cup or would you like it in a syringe? Straightforward, no choices, but to take the medicine. That's what this means. Because four-year-olds will do everything not to take it. Which concept reinforces the development of sense of trust for an infant? You know, talk about trust. We're talking about Erickson. Trust versus mistrust. Infants know if they're trusting their parents, if they cry, somebody's gonna come get them. Somebody's gonna pick them up, feed them if they're hungry, change your diaper if they're wet, burp them. Whatever they need, they know their needs are met. That mistrust infant 
wouldn't be crying like that because, you know, they've already tried so hard and nobody's listening. So they become more apathetic that if they're hungry, they have to wait. And this is abuse for an infant. So if a child's not crying when they're hungry or when they need things, it's actually a red flag for me. An infant is NPO, unable to take breast or bottle for feedings. What's important to remember for this infant? When we need to maintain normal growth and development on these children. <clears throat> One of the things that we have with um, infants is that they can soothe themselves. They can decrease their stress by just the sucking, chewing, and biting, which is, you know, everything oral, like Freud says, right? So offer non-nutritive sucking, that pacifier, nothing on the mouth on an NPO child. Um, it could cause aspiration, <clears throat> pneumonias, if, especially if you have a child uh, like has a tracheal esophageal fistula, it's gonna go right into their lungs. So nothing in the mouth, we're gonna give a nice little pacifier and they can self-soothe, which is what we want. When teaching sex education and contraceptive for adolescents, what should the nurse consider? <clears throat> so teenagers, how we teach them is number one, keep your biases and opinions away from it and only offer them oral and written information they can go back to refer to. So this is the way that we would teach them about it. So if they have something written, they can go to refer to it instead of going to their friends, et cetera. The monthly immunization for RSV, respiratory cynical virus, given to those uh, immunosuppressed children, given to cardiac, premature children, children with respiratory issues. It's usually given through fall to early spring and it's synergist or palizumab. And this helps prevent them from getting this virus. And the only thing with this virus is it's hard to suck, swallow and breathe. So now you have this extra mucus in the airway and it's very difficult. So we don't want it for those children. So we give synergists to prevent that. A child, an infant with hypoplastic left hearts become a tachypnic, taking a long time to eat and requires rest. What assessment is priority? When you see these symptoms, what do you need to assess? What do you think is happening to this child? So tachypnic, breathing fast, long time to eat, probably something's going on with their lungs. This is a child with a cardiac condition. This child already has a hard time just, you know, oxygenating. When you see them becoming tired quickly, think of congestive failure. Aus auscultate your lungs on this one, okay? Simple as that. When doing an assessment on an infant with a low-grade fever and a loose cough, what information is priority for placement? Now, something you don't think about, you get a call from admissions, you have an infant to be admitted to your floor. What room do you put them in? Which is appropriate? So if I know the immunization status, that they're up to date, put them into a room with another child with a loose cough, which is just upper respiratory, it would be a good choice. If I don't know immunization status, I would pick another room for that child to go to. <clears throat> a three-year-old is brought into the ER with increased wheezing for the past two days. The child is using an MDI. What is the most important information you need to ask? They have one of those meter dose inhalers. And they've been using it and it's still wheezing, getting worse. Well, 
did the child get it? The kid's three years old. Did you use a spacer? Did they get all the medicine? Very good. <clears throat> Multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? Well, cystic fibrosis is mucus in the lungs and congestion in the GI tract and the inability to um, use nutrients in the body. So a high protein diet is going to prevent muscle wasting, which we want. We're going to, of course, aggressive, aggressive, aggressive chest physiotherapy, get those lungs moving and get that mucus up. Those pancreatic enzymes with meals within 30 minutes of eating, it should be done. Now, the sweat test is uh, given to diagnose cystic fibrosis, and you see large amounts of salt in the sweat. So we are not putting this child on a low sodium. They need sodium in their diet. They're losing it. Which information is most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? Rheumatic fever is that recent sore throat, probably a strep infection, and we treat it by treating the strep infection, giving antibiotics for a longer amount of time. A multi-select. What are some assessments that an infant would have if they were in acute respiratory distress? So you would actually see abdominal breathing, not diaphragmatic. That's actually what you should have. It's more abdominal breathing fast, but nasal flaring, and then they're grunting. I'm scared. As I said, I hear an infant grunting with the flaring. They're going right to the trauma room. They are about to give up. They really need aggressive, quick care in order to prevent intubation on these children. And a respiratory rate of 34 doesn't show acute respiratory distress. That's sort of normal um, at that age. If it was 20, now we're going to, we are failing and just about not, you know, to stop breathing. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with a patent ductus arteriosus? So fetal circulation has a connection called a PDA between the aorta and the uh, pulmonary artery. And it allows oxygen to go to the body when we need to. And at birth, it closes. And the whole thing with the PDA, to keep it open, you need uh, prostaglandins, whether it's normal, naturally formed by the mother, or if it's given in a synthetic form um, in an intravenous continuous drip. Now, we stop prostaglandins, the duct's gonna close. We want it open, we're gonna, uh, we'll continue that prostaglandins and that slow drip. What is the greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization? I mean, we know if we have an issue, we see something, they're going for a cardiac cath to really diagnose them well. But the biggest thing is the hemorrhage. Think about the femoral artery, femoral vein, they're big. And if that clot comes off, they can bleed a lot of blood really quick. And we don't want that. It's the first thing I always check, the dressing. A 10 month old status post VSD repair is getting morning meds. What med should the nurse question with a blood pressure of 118 over 70, temp 99, pulse 88, and respiratory rate of 22? What med would you say, you know, I'm holding these meds because I need to call the doctor? 
and that's the digoxin. Vasotec and allopril are something that is used to decrease peripheral vascular um, constriction. It dilates it so blood pressures come down. It allows the heart to beat against no pressure, basically. But digoxin lowers, decreases heart rate, so it's already too low. We're going to stop it, probably do a dig level. While assessing a newborn infant, you notice decreased femoral pulses bilaterally. What nurse action should be next? You just got the newborn right from the mom into the nursery and you're assessing it. And you see those femoral pulses are really weak, really decreased, almost non-existent. What do you do next to confirm what you think is going on? If you have femoral pulses that are not there or really weak, think of coarctation of the aorta. And the way to diagnose it and tell the physician is that four extremity blood pressure. The uppers will be higher and the lowers will be lower because a lot of blood can't get there. Really good, good job. How do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? I mean, we know that we need to have parents leave the room at some point so we can discuss certain things with adolescents because they're not going to talk in front of their mom and dad. I wouldn't, so I don't blame them. But now you're the nurse. How are you going to get them to talk to you? So start to ask them about what they, what they like to do, what sort of music, what you know, sports do they like? You know, if they're going to college, where they're going, something that you see about them that opens up a conversation. When they feel comfortable with you, they'll tell you so many things and actually more things than you want to know. The thing is not to look like you're shocked with some of the things that they do say. A multi select. When educating adolescents about risks for HIV and hepatitis, what would you include? <clears throat> so, I mean, abstinence is always the best to prevent HIV hepatitis condoms, if not, and then of course, hand washing is always important with any prevention of any spread of infection. What stage of Erickson would you use for a school age child? Remember school age children love to please and they love to do things well, whether it is you know, the best speller, the best writer, you know, the one who can throw the ball the farthest. And when they can't do things well as somebody else, they feel inferior. It is industry versus inferiority. I can bake a cake good, but I cannot kick a ball. I am not athletic at all. And that makes them frustrated. And that industry is what they can do well, whether it's getting A's at school or kicking that ball, whatever it is. A multi-select. A child with hemophilia, swollen, the knee swollen and painful, treatment would include what? Well, what's hemophilia? Well, that's a lack of a clotting factor and the child has a tendency to bleed. So what are you thinking here we need to do besides giving some home therapy um, for the factor? And they will give the factor at home. They need to elevate that knee, all the rice. They're going to rest, ice, put it in an ace bandage and elevate it. And cold packs, never hot packs because you don't want to dilate and cause more bleeding. You want to constrict those vessels. Your child has ALL, has recent lab results, and the platelet count is 10,000. Nursing action when you see this. Now, it doesn't matter the diagnosis of the child. You see a platelet count of 10,000. What are you thinking? What does that mean? Platelets have to do with bleeding coagulopathies. This child is at high risk for bleeding. So yes, place them on bleeding precautions. Good job. 
a child starts with a nosebleed for no reason, what action should you do first? You're going to apply pressure on the nose with the thumb and the finger for 10 minutes. Um, it will stop bleeding usually. If not, they need to go and get some medical assistance. Never go back because they'll swallow all of that blood. Good job. An eight-year-old semi-conscious boy is brought to the ER. Blood sugar is greater than 600. Potassium's high, pH is low. What is your priority action to do? What's the first thing you need to do for this child? We can see this kid's DKA. So we know that this child needs a normal saline bolus right away. And as we're doing that, we're gonna need to give some regular insulin IV and slowly bring down that blood sugar. So fluids is number one. And then with the fluids, the insulin. Seeing kids go from pale, semi-conscious, giving a bolus of fluid, a little bit of insulin, all of a sudden they're awake and alert and pink and they are themselves again. A child admitted for hypoparathyroidism, what findings would you see that need to be reported to the healthcare provider? Well, the parathyroid regulates what? That's the question here. And when you figure out what it regulates, you can figure out what symptom here says there's something going on. And it's all about calcium. The parathyroid has something to do with the regulation of calcium in your body. If you do not have calcium in your body, you're gonna start seeing this muscle weakness. And that's the beginning step. So if we call the healthcare provider, do a calcium level, we can immediately give a supplement to it and prevent further weakness. So the parathyroid, think calcium. A child has Kuzmol respirations due to DKA. The increased respiratory rate is trying to compensate for what acid-base alteration? It's trying to compensate for what acid-base alteration? So we know that this child is in metabolic acidosis because of DKA. We know Kuzmol respiration puts them into a respiratory alkalosis. That is to compensate but we know that Kuzmol, we're breathing that way because we're trying to, the body is trying to correct that metabolic acidosis. As I said, please go and revisit your uh, ABGs for this HESI. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? Just let them sit there and tell you exactly how they feel. And as I said, do not look surprised at some things you hear because you're gonna hear some things. What procedure is priority to keep the lungs of a child with CF open? I think with cystic fibrosis, the most important thing with children with these lungs that are clogged is that chest physiotherapy. I mean, without an airway, you don't have anything, right? But that getting up, deep breathing, coughing, moving, exercising, ambulating, not PRN, several times a day, uh, keeps those lungs moving and prevention of pneumonias. In school age conflict of industry versus inferiority, what does industry mean?
So the industry is what they can do well, okay? That's what industry is, whether it's kicking the ball, baking a cake, um, writing the best, the best speller, the best math, whatever it is, that is the industry. It's doing it well. The inferiority is what they can't do well. They'd like to, but they can't. That's why they feel inferior. Contraindication to administering the varicella vaccine to an adolescent. Well, what is a varicella vaccine? It is a live vaccine. What are precautions we know about that? Doesn't matter if it's an adult or a child. We cannot give a live vaccine to a child who is immunosuppressed and being on corticosteroids is immunosuppressed. So we cannot um, give these uh, to those sort of children. Has nothing to do with dairy. Early detection of a hearing impairment is critical. Which one is of primary importance? So we worry about speech. If you can't hear, your speech isn't going to be as clear as it should be. In helping a child to adapt to a hospitalization experience, the best approach is what? So when you have a child go into a hospital, especially the younger ones, keep them on the same routines, have the, you know, meal times the same, the same sort of foods, you know, the baths at the same time. This keeps a child comfortable because they know and can predict what's coming next. When assessing vision on a child, the healthcare provider would use a spelling chart at what distance? And what would you do if they are looking at this distance and they are not seeing things clearly? So it is 20 feet. And if we don't see it clearly at 20 feet, we know there's gonna be some visual problems. So we need to tell the physician about that. Referrals for cognitive impairment should occur when As soon as you can, early intervention is the best. We can get these children back on track most of the time. How would you help encourage a preschooler to be less apprehensive when taking their vital signs? And of course, let them play with it. Very good. I think you get that idea for sure. The nurse is discussing sexuality with the parents of an adolescent with cognitive impairment. What is important? You know, some children become adolescents and young adults that are able to live on their own and they need to understand what normals of life is. If we have a well-defined concrete code of sexual conduct, this child will know when a touch is wrong when things are not the way it should be because they don't really understand it as clearly. So making sure they have this concrete code, they're not gonna be abused because people abuse these children all the time. What acid base imbalance would you might see with a child having profuse diarrhea? <clears throat> And that is metabolic acidosis. You lose a lot of alkaline out of diarrhea because of all of the enzymes that are used in digestion in the small intestines. So all those alkalines come out. Alkaline is gone, it becomes acidotic. A multi-select. If an infant has not passed the meconium stool within the first day, day and a half, what would you assess for? <clears throat> we 
we know that Hirschsprungs, sometimes they have a little bit of ribbon stools that come out, but most of the time not. That's big outpatching. Cystic fibrosis, hypothyroidism. Many times these are diagnosed because of the no stool. Electrolyte imbalance has nothing to do with stooling at all. A child with sickle cell disease would most likely exhibit what sign? I think this is what brings these children into for help for medical care, whether it's the physician's office or in the emergency room. And it's all about the pain. I mean, we know that the child's dehydrated. Um, with that, they, have, they are tachycardic. And we are going to bolus them with fluid immediately to dilate those vessels to help decrease the pain. But they come in with the pain. When teaching the child and family about celiac disease, which one of these food items is allowed? So it's wheat, barley, and rye are not allowed. So rice is, yes. A six-year-old goes to the ER due to abdominal pain, fever, vomiting for the last day. What assessment is priority? What are you going to ask this child? They're in there with abdominal pain, fever, and vomiting. What, what do you need to know? Where is that pain? Is it an acute surgical abdomen? What is going on? We need to know where that pain is. Good. I'll multi-select. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So we know that there's a thickened muscular area at the level of the pyloric sphincter and it feels like a little olive and it really does. And then of course, it is across the room projectile vomiting. I've told you before that when I get a small child, infant, that one month to three month old, they're saying they're vomiting, describe the vomiting. Is it just a little dribble or is it out, just burst across the room? Because is, is it reflux or is it pyloric stenosis? A multi-select. A child with chronic kidney disease has renal osteodystrophy. What outcomes would you see because of that? What is renal osteodystrophy? So osteodystrophy is a lack of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D has everything to do with bone and bone growth. If you don't have enough, you'll have bone pain, and then you, your child's going to be slow at growing. You're going to see a smaller child. So that is osteodystrophy in a child, low vitamin D levels, and they'll be smaller. You suspect an infant has cryptoorchidism. What would you, how would you examine this infant? And it makes a big difference in a male infant. So we know that heat tends to have the testicles relax and come out to a normal level. If the room was cold, they would pull back up. They're trying to protect themselves. So to get an accurate exam, have the child in a warm room and you'll get an accurate result. A multi-select. What teaching would you give parents on how a hypospadias is corrected? I think the most important thing to think of is you have a infant and the uh, infant's family is Jewish. And now we have to take this foreskin and use it for other things. It's not going to be that brisk, that, you know, formal 
you know, thing that they do with removing that foreskin. That foreskin is used to remove that uh, opening underneath the um, penis. Epispadius is on top, hypospadius is on bottom. And then what they do is they take a thin sort of uh, tube and it looks like actually those female straight catheter sets that we use. They're sort of, sort of rigid, but soft. We put it in there and we leave it there to keep that um, canal open and patent. All we're gonna do is take a little gauze and put it on the end of it. We're not gonna flush it, not do anything to it, but just put a gauze there and change diapers. That's all we do with it. A multi-select. Children with nephrotic syndrome are often given albumin and Lasix for fluid overload. What outcome do you want from giving those things? Remember, nephrotic syndrome has absolutely nothing to do with kidney failure, nothing. Nephrotic syndrome is a kidney saying, this protein is here, I don't know what to do with it, let's get rid of it. So they lose protein like crazy. So hypoalbuminemia, and you're gonna see um, really um, high levels of proteinuria. Now we give albumin, which is protein, we replace that intravascular space with protein. It pulls the fluid back into the vasculature from the interstitial space. Give Lasix, push it through. We should see that increased urine output, that edema should go away. And because of all those things, your blood pressure should also go down. Has nothing to do with a fever, nothing. A two-year-old goes to the ER with inconsolable crying and a painful abdomen. What findings shows you this is a medical emergency? Well, what are some conditions you know about a painful abdomen and inconsolable crying? What would be a symptom of one of those conditions? And this is intussusception. This is current jelly stool. It's the one thing that's a little in the, di the diaper. Be current jelly, maybe a little bit of blood in it, but this is like, okay, this is interception. How do we repair it or fix it? Well, first you diagnose it, ultrasound, take it over to radiology. We do that air, um, we pump like an enema to pop it open or it goes to surgery. But inconsolable crying, painful abdomen at that age into susception. <clears throat> when assessing a two month old with vomiting, what questions should you ask the parent? So we wanna know, did it dribble or come straight out? Now, if it just dribbled, we're going to ask how many ounces, how often are they eating, and if they're burping. That would be part of GERD. But when you see forcefulness, it's coming out, then we know it's pyloric um, stenosis. And the first thing we do is make them NPO. You notice a two-year-old child with congestive heart disease, the heart rate is decreasing. What other information is important to report to the healthcare provider? A two-year-old has congenital heart disease. That heart rate is slowly going down and down. <clears throat> a two-year-old with a blood pressure of 68 over 44 is not perfusing. This is something that's an emergency. We need to call uh, and get that healthcare provider and get this child on some support for that heart. Something is failing. Something's not right. A multi-select. When entering the room of a child, the child becomes stiff and arms and legs start shaking. Priority actions for you. What should you do? So, you want to number one, notify the response team. You want to turn the kid to the side, of course, any seizure in case they vomit. And you always are going to monitor the time and duration of the seizure. 
you don't want the parent to leave the room. You want the parent to be there to understand what they need to do in case there's a seizure. A three-year-old boy with waddling gait and falling is admitting for testing. What examination should you anticipate? Three-year-old boy, waddling gait. Let's go further. Lordosis, scour sign, falling. They're coming into the hospital. What do you think this could be? And then what do we um, examine to sort of say, yes, it is that. And this is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So when you see the gait falling, that means the muscles aren't working well. And we know Duchenne is a progressive muscle wasting. So the EMG looks at the muscle, the way it responds when you stimulate it with an, um, some sort of electrical current. Remember, these hurt. Remember that we do warn the parents they could be a little uncomfortable afterwards and that we give them something for pain. I mean, it could be just Tylenol or Motrin, but give them something. A mother calls the clinic about her child. She's playing in the woods and has a rash that is spreading. What over-the-counter medicine's good to give her? So when you see or hear this parents telling you there's a rash and it is spreading, you need to get that child to seek help. This could be an anaphylaxis. If it was a rash that's there and it's just, you know, isn't moving anywhere, okay, you can give an antihistamine. But when you see it spreading, you don't know how far that will go. The safest choice to tell that parent is to go get some medical attention, whether to come in to the doctor or to go to urgent care, doesn't matter. So the mother calls the clinic again. A friend of her child has ticks from playing in the field. What would you tell the mom to do? And your daughter's friend has ticks. They were out playing in the field all day long. What do you need to do? And all you do with, when you're suspecting ticks, okay, whether you saw them or you've been told another child has, just examine the child for ticks. And if you see them, just make sure you get the whole tick out. And if you're having issues getting the tick out, of course, seek medical attention. An adolescent goes to the school nurse complaining of ringing in the ears. What exam should you do first? So number one, just look in the ear, see if something's happening there. I mean, as simple as that. And you're going to do the other stuff too, but it is looking into the ears, see if there's any physical reason first. Probably have their music blaring in there. It's part of it, but don't assume ever. Last question, and it's a multi-select. An infant's being discharged after 14 days of vancomycin. What teaching should be included for that parent. It could be due to osteomyelitis. It could be due to a bacterial meningitis. And they've been on these aminoglucosides for 14 days for a staph infection. What are you concerned about? You're worried about the ears and you're worried about their urinary output because we know it can kill the ears and it can also damage kidneys. That's why we monitor peaks and troughs so closely. But monitoring troughs later on, that, no, we're not going to do that. Are we gonna give NSAIDs? Well, of course, if they need it, but the two big things with Vanco is the hearing and the kidneys. Let's see how we did. Number three, Ortega did it, good job. Number two, LP. Number one, whoop, 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 whoop. Mary, you did it, whoop, whoop, whoop. Number four, we got initials, D-I and R-W. 
So that's the first of the reviews for the Hessies that I've done for you. I'll do the other one on Thursday. It'll be 100 questions. Now, make sure if you haven't uploaded those exams, be diligent to get them uploaded. I know that there's issues. I just got a message from the Dean too. She's aware that it's going on. And right now you can't access ExamSoft at all. So be patient, get them uploaded, okay? And I'll get you your, your exam grades. Yes. Oh, I was gonna ask you that, like the preliminary, at least like when can we I, You've already sent me a message for it. I will make sure it's there. If you Thank haven't you. put it into a message in Canvas, put it into a message in Canvas and I'll get you your grades as soon you. as I can, okay? Um, Professor? Yes. It's Marley. I just wanted to let you know that I just told me my exam uploaded, so I just wanted to double check. Did it upload? It told me it did, finally. Oh, good. Let's check. Let's see what this is doing now. Oh, look at that. I think we're going to be good. All right, thank you. Oh, wow. Come on. Hold on, hold on. I'm not there yet but we're better than we were. Okay, updating scores. <laughs> I got your scores. Hey. Okay, those of you there? Yes. Wait, I'll give them to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Would it be possible to go over the exam or? Not until after they all, all the students do, but I'd love to, Lewis. Um, after Friday, Friday evening, let me know. I will. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't have all of them yet. It's uploading them very slowly. Professor. Yes. My own problem is pressure. Did you because upload it yet? It's not uploading yet. I'm using the school computer. Okay. Somebody just had it uploaded. It's just starting to work. I know. Don't Mine just now uploaded. Upload. It just uploaded. Do you hear that? So yeah, please mine okay. just try again. I, I have said, a question. I have a, I have a question. What I'm asking, what I want to ask is if I close the computer and open it back, is it going to affect me? I wouldn't take that chance. <laughs> I wouldn't take that chance. <laughs> I wouldn't take so that chance. So my problem is I have to leave the school premises. Though I've seen one of the instru I mean one of the instructors that signed me out with a computer okay, try again try again things are coming through now okay okay let me, let me try again then okay it seems to be coming one at a time this is oof. 